Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled The OCIO Advantage, brought to you by Arnrich Messina, a Portland, Oregon-based independent employee-owned investment advisory firm focused on providing OCIO services to a variety of client types. For more information, please visit our website at arnrichmessina.com. The purpose of today's webinar is to touch on the positive benefits of, of an OCIO structure and why a committee may wish to consider this type of approach. All attendees are muted with no camera. We can't hear you, but don't worry, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to submit questions at any time, and we may not be able to get to them at the end of the presentation. We'll try to answer all of the questions, but if we run short on time, we'll capture any unanswered questions and do our best to get back to you individually. We'll also send out a recording of the presentation uh, within a few days following the webinar for those who are unable to attend. Let me go ahead and introduce our speakers in agenda. Uh, joining us as a guest speaker is Bill Thorndike. Uh, he is the chairman and president of Medford Fabrication, uh, which is a uh, Medford-based custom steel fabrication company that is family owned and been in operation for 76 years. He's also a committee member of Northwest Health Foundation. Uh, Chris will participate uh, in, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Bill will participate in a Q&A with Chris to discuss how an OCIO approach helps with the overall investment process at Northwest Health. Uh, I, my name is James Ellis. I'm a senior consultant and senior advisor with Arnrich Messina. I've been providing traditional consulting and OCIO services to a variety of institutional clientele. I have about 22 years of industry experience in working primarily with institutional clients, and I am a CFA charter holder. Uh, Chris Van Dyke is also joining me. He is a senior consultant and senior advisor with, with, with Arnrich Messina. He is also a principal of the firm. Uh, he also provides traditional consulting and OCIO services to a variety of institutional clientele and has about 20 years of experience in working with institutional clients. Chris is also a CFA charter holder as well as a chartered alternative investment analyst as well. So let's dive right into it. As far as the uh, agenda uh, is concerned, what we want to do is discuss what is OCIO. Now this is an acronym that stands for Outsourced Chief Investment Officer. It has a variety of different names, a variety of different definitions. At the outset, we just want to describe and define what we mean by OCIO. We also want to discuss why a committee might consider this type of approach. So why OCIO will be second. Uh, lastly, uh, Chris will interview Bill Thorndike uh, and discuss the advantages of, of an OCIO model with, with uh, the Northwest Health Foundation. So with that, let's go ahead and discuss what we mean by OCIO. You can see here in the uh, table some differences between a traditional consulting approach whereby a committee approves recommendations from a consultant versus a discretionary portfolio management or OCIO approach, uh, whereby uh, the uh, advisor uh, makes decisions on uh, behalf of the organization. So OCIO has various different definitions and various different uh, terms, if you will. Uh, again, OCIO, Outsourced Chief Investment Officer. This is also uh, known as delegated consulting or discretionary consulting. And at its heart, it's a legal construct uh, allowing a consultant to make adjustments to a portfolio without prior committee approval. This is typically done within predetermined asset class ranges that are determined uh, by the, uh, the committee or perhaps the board. Uh, then the consultant will implement uh, you know, an asset allocation, uh, both a target allocation or strategic as well as tactical tilts and, and implement manager changes, again, without prior committee approval. Uh, another key distinguishing feature is typically uh, the advisor uh, for an o OCIO or discretionary portfolio management type of construct makes trades on behalf of the organization. This is sometimes not the case with a traditional consulting approach. So uh, again, at its, at its heart, uh, the uh, consultant or advisor in this case with a discretionary portfolio management approach takes on fiduciary responsibility and makes changes to the portfolio without prior committee approval. So moving forward, why would somebody want to consider this type of approach? So some of the benefits of an OCIO approach are it allows the organization to manage their own affairs. 
deal with governance and organizational issues, as well as uh, spend time doing fundraising, donor outreach, those things that really move the needle for the organization. It also allows the advisor to implement a process uh, and within that process, maintain a long-term time horizon. Typically an endowment or foundation has a perpetual time horizon and the portfolio should be managed in line with that time horizon. Uh, the advisor can then leverage their experience to maintain that time horizon, maintain that focus, and limit emotions as well by exercising patience, discipline, and staying the course. Also an advisor can place certain triggers within the portfolio, such as rebalancing triggers, be it 20, uh, you know, when there's a 20% decline in the, uh, you know, in the S&P 500, for instance, 30% decline, uh, you know, various different triggers can be, be implemented into the portfolio. Uh, and in so doing, it removes bias and emotion from managing the portfolio. And again, allows the portfolio to maintain that long-term horizon and ferret out uh, the noise uh, that perhaps the portfolio may undergo like we did uh, this past March of this year. So with regards to uh, some of the benefits, this can have uh, you know, a dollar value type of return. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is a simple little analysis that we did uh, with regards to rebalancing the portfolio uh, in a discretionary type of construct. So what we have here is a total return of a hypothetical portfolio comprised of 70% uh, stocks and 30% bonds. Uh, without rebalancing, you can see that the portfolio returned uh, roughly uh, a decline of 8.2%. With rebalancing back to targets, uh, the decline was uh, a negative 7.3% for a gain of almost 1%. Now, the reason that we chose uh, these uh, particular rebalancing uh, dates and time uh, were that, uh, you can see here, I, I should point out, the, the date that the rebalancing occurred was March 18th, 2020. It's down below in the footnote there. The reason we chose that date was this represented a 20% decline from the high that the S&P achieved in late February. So this was more or less just kind of a miscellaneous point in time. We certainly didn't catch the bottom, if you will, but nonetheless, this portfolio trigger uh, albeit the, the market did recover nicely off the March lows uh, into April, but you can see again, the total return from uh, January 31st to April 30th with this rebalancing that occurred on March 18th uh, produced a positive net return of 92 basis points. So again, this is just uh, you know one of the benefits to having a discretionary type of approach is it, it can be additive from a dollar perspective. So moving forward, uh, why choose OCIO now? Why would you uh, consider switching now? Again, there are some behavioral aspects. It allows the advisor to implement patience and discipline. Uh, it relieves the committee of the burden of making difficult decisions in difficult market environments. It, it was very, you know, it, it takes a lot of patience to rebalance, uh, you know, in a, a rapidly declining type of market environment like we experienced in March. Uh, we as advisors have a lot of experience in this area based on our, uh, our um, you know, long time horizon in, in doing this and managing client uh, portfolios in a discretionary type of arrangement. So it allows uh, the emotion to be removed uh, from, from those types of decisions. Uh, the markets are also becoming increasingly complex. It allows the committee members to guide the organization, not necessarily become investment specialists, focusing on the minutia and details of each investment manager, or why there's uh, certain tilts in the portfolio. Uh, it removes these types of burdens from the committee and allows them to focus again on moving the needle, what moves the needle for the organization. So at its heart, OCIO is an extension of staff uh, and allows the advisor to place trades uh, on the committee's behalf as well. So it reduces administrative burden as well. So with that, let me go ahead and turn it over to Chris. He will begin the Q&A portion of the discussion with Bill. Chris, over to you. Very good. Well, thank you very much, James. Appreciate the time. Again, Chris Van Dyke, a senior consultant advisor with Arnrich, uh, here today with us. Again, thank you, Bill, for taking the time out of your busy day uh, to discuss your experience as well as perspective in terms of both non-discretionary but also discretionary, which is referred to here as OCIO. 
Um, I'd really like to get your background because you've been working with committees, on committees, on boards for multiple decades, and you as well as anyone would know just what the evolution has been over time and why the time really now is as good as ever for the structure to uh, really con be conducive for OCIO type structures. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, yes, I've had the uh, unique opportunity of, of serving on different foundation and nonprofit boards uh, for 40 years now. Um, I had the great opportunity as a, as a young professional uh, to do that. And um, I, again, I can reflect back to the days of stock pickers and, and investment committees uh, of, you know, uh, people trying to say, oh, you should have bought AT&T at this or what have you. So we've seen a, a dramatic change. Um, I had the good fortune of serving on the Oregon Community Foundation uh, for 10 and a half years as um, that organization basically created almost like a hockey stick, you know, to today almost $2 billion in assets. Yeah. But I think it really talks to the importance of, uh, of, a, of a good investment committee involvement uh, with the organization, but particularly um, in the case of Northwest Health Foundation um, that I've served on now for about six years, uh, and again, it makes grants throughout the state of Oregon and, and Southwest Washington. Um, and so we have a vision and a commitment to what we want to do in improving health. And of course, we want to make sure that our investments are, are tied uh, to those types of in, uh, investments and, and the ability uh, to uh, further, the Northwest Health Foundation, uh, which was a convergent foundation about 25 years ago, to continue to do great work. So uh, again, it's it, it's been a, a, a unique opportunity uh, for me. I've had the opportunity of serving on large foundations and small foundations, but I also always seem to come back to the fact that if the foundation can generate more revenue to basically serve its purpose, that's the goal. Yeah, absolutely. Now, from our perspective, we have these discussions in the past and we've worked a lot together, Bill, over now a couple of years. Um, the biggest point you've brought up historically and why even Northwest Health Foundation was comfortable moving to such a structure was, generally speaking, a lot of the components were already in place. It was really a parameters, guidelines, oversight, monitoring. A lot of those really had already been in place and provided a lot of latitude from your perspective to provide that trust transfer, I guess is the way of putting it. Right, right, and, and, and sharing of responsibility, I think is, is really what we're looking at. And um, we as an organization had to take a look at uh, just basically how we were doing business and how much it cost us to do business. Uh, and, and we've again split some duties. We now have a director of finance where before we had a vice president, a CFO, uh, who had responsibilities um, uh, for the investments too. Uh, and again, that comes at a great cost in today's marketplace to find uh, the type of person uh, that you can hire and have that type of expertise, not only on your financial side, uh, but on the investment side. So uh, from our perspective, again, based on the relationship that we've uh, developed with Arnich and Messina, uh, we felt comfortable in extending, if you want to say it, this responsibility or this connection uh, between you as, as our CIO uh, and, and, and being able to, again, help you be a better partner uh, with our director of finance. Um, and again, so I think, again, it's it, it just gets down to the bottom line that um, you, you're dealing with this every single day. The nice thing is you have other clients similar to us so that hopefully we can share in some of the good decision making uh, that you're doing for other foundations uh, going forward. So for you know a modest sized foundation, we're about 50 to $60 million foundation, uh, you can see where if we can shave a few a point or half a point off of our administrative costs, that really makes a difference in our ability to make the two to two and a half million dollar grants that really make a difference in Oregon and Southwest Washington. Absolutely. One other thing I've noticed we've talked about, and there have been plenty of studies, I think Mercer put one out, and James, if you could roll to that slide that shows just the decision-making framework and how sometimes just getting an idea or even an investment implemented can take a lot of time. Um, you had actually brought this up at our, our earlier discussions, Bill. Um, I'm not going to read over each one of these, but 
it's a laborious process to get from an idea that's been identified all the way till implementation. And, and you say as much in terms of just your experience historically. I mean, going back even to deciding on a stock with AT&T, how would you suggest that, you know, th that changes your view in terms of responsibility as a volunteer for many of these institutions? Yes, and I think, you know, that's one of the things that we're always, um, you know, we, we, our board of trustees ultimately has fiduciary responsibility uh, for our foundation. And so the more we can uh, effectively communicate with an entire board, uh, not just the members of the investment or finance committee, uh, and do it in such a way that it's understandable or that we can get answers quickly uh, makes a difference for us. And so, uh, again, the role of the consultant really as a partner uh, rather than uh, uh, you know, a step away type uh, arrangement is something that I, I feel has a lot of merit to it. And I think all of us in any of our organizations, um, you know, we're outsourcing so many other things now, whether it's our human resources, whether it's um, our decisions on insurance brokers and stuff, and such mm -hmm. have you, that, that it's, it's really changed. But again, I also feel comfortable uh, that in dealing uh, with you, Chris, and with R.H. Messina, that I know that you have high standards, you have high responsibilities, um, you have it based on, you know, the accomplishments that all of you have and your ability to put some additional letters out to the back of your name, that again brings some comfort level uh, to us and, you know, to, and when we go through our work with our CPAs and our audits and stuff. So, you no, know, I just think, again, uh, this, and it, it's, it certainly played out this year, um, you know, for an organization like us, uh, we're trying to protect the corpus of the foundation. And again, the work that we've done in repositioning the overall allocation of the assets, how we're moving towards that, how we're trying to reduce risk, but also make that return that will allow us to be able to continue to uh, do our good work into the future, uh, I think is something that I feel very comfortable with. No, I appreciate the kind words. And yeah, James and I worked pretty hard for those letters behind our names, so I can't deny yes. that. <laughs> but the one thing I do want to touch on with you is that's another aspect that investments, I mean, you mentioned that even in our meeting yesterday in terms of the investment committee, that performance is really what we're going to be measured upon, but there are so many other ancillary benefits, including operational, uh, trading and execution, audit, finance, what have you. So. There's a lot of what James mentioned, which is an extension of staff, which from an investment committee may or may not go noticed or, or very well may go unnoticed, but it's very important nonetheless. One thing from you, Bill, um, generally speaking, when you've seen other non-discretionary clients versus you know, maybe the more delegated authority, do you feel as though there's more, more time for education, strategic initiatives, really taking an eye on the longer term? I, I've seen that with other committees where we spend a lot more time on larger picture items and providing a lot more clarity around board direction and long-term objectives as opposed to the minutiae of day-to-day -day management. No, I think you, you bring up a, a good point, you know, particularly since you know, we're, we're entrusted with a entity or some assets uh, during our time on the board, uh, which again comes and goes, and so the, the ability to be you know involved and, and to talk about the big picture. Um, <laughs> I think we can all remember the time not too many years ago where um, the investment committees were basically subject to the dog and pony show of every manager out there that was in their deal. They would fly in, they would do their dog and pony show for 20 minutes or 30 minutes and then move on. And uh, again, while it was certainly interesting, um, I, I think we all agreed that it really didn't give a chance for the members of the investment committee or the finance committee of the different boards to really kind of understand better what were they responsible for what types of investments uh, did they want to see put in place? What type of growth did they really need to see to be able to allow the organization to continue to do its work in the future? So uh, again, I think that we've certainly seen an evolution in most of the organizations, you know, away from that to more of a understanding of really what the trustees are looking for. And more importantly, the understanding of the strategic direction of the institution because ultimately, hopefully, that then gets 
uh, incorporated back into our PSYOP. Exactly. Exactly right. Is there anything as far as like additional takeaways or thoughts you would have, Bill, as far as just the difference and kind of what really, when you're looking at it from a, because I mean, a lot of committees talk about it. It's really time and commitment. I've, I've brought up with committees that are non-discretionary and maintain, maintain they want to continue to be so. And I suggest that as long as you have good structure, a lot of strong volunteerism and a clear, dedicated, you know, discipline moving forward, you, you have the ability to do so. But there's just a lot of other ancillary benefits that I bring up that we discussed today. Right. And I, I just want to bring that to you to see if there's anything else that you would suggest that kind of puts you over, over the top, so to speak, with an OCI discretionary. You know, I think, you know, particularly uh, in, in the case of Arnix and Messina, uh, I know that you have an in-house corporate counsel. So I know that you have somebody, you have, some, you have an attorney that's really concerned about <laughs> how all of the different investment vehicles are done. You have a compliance function uh, within your organization. And, and so again, when, when I look at, I, I don't just look and say, well, I like Chris, you know, he does a good <laughs> job. You know, but the reality is, it's not just Chris, it's a, it's a whole group of individuals within Arnish and Messina supporting your role as our OCIO. And I, I'm sorry, I feel more comfortable with that. <laughs> and the reality is that you're providing a service, not only on the consulting side, but on the OCIO side. And again, if we ever get to a point where we're disappointed or whatever, you know, it's like you say, we can move on. I mean, this is a, it's, it's a professional relationship that we have with you and with your organization. Um, and it's predicated on us getting the quality of service uh, that we need. Um, if, we're not, if, if you're not meeting our expectations, just as the managers that you go out and recruit and put into our portfolios, if they don't perform, um, you, you, you move on. And so again, I think the interesting thing here is that um, it's if anything made this a little cleaner so that if ever we get to that point uh, it's easier for us to say chris it isn't working for us i'm glad you have an, another stable of clients that is working for them whereas i think again for an annual organization like ourselves uh, trying to make that hard decision of you know letting an individual go who's on staff versus the professionalism that we see in whether it's our attorneys or our CPAs or whatever. Uh, again, I just think that again, you, you create a cleaner system for us to really make sure that our investment policies and how they're actually played out uh, will, will be effective. That's perfect. I appreciate I hope I didn't that. Your <laughs> no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm used to hearing that. <laughs> uh, James, I, I want to see if there's any questions that have come up. I, I don't, I want to be, very cognizant of Bill's time. He's been more yeah. than generous with it. Absolutely. Uh, let me take a look here. Uh, if anybody has a question, feel free to use the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of the screen, and we will get uh, an answer for you here. Uh, taking a look here, uh, a question for Bill. How did the OCIO model help during the recent turbulent market environment? Um, Again, I had the good fortune, and as many of us that serve on these different boards are involved, that um, again, our, our ability to connect uh, with Chris um, and not just look at the March 31st you know, printout and you know, be able to know almost in real time um, how some of the things that were done and implemented during that time period of, of an upset. I mean, it was, uh, again, I, we were very pleased with where we are today, we continue to, I think, outperform, um, you know, the, the goals that we have uh, relative to, to, to the allocation that we have right now. So, um, no, I think, again, just from, uh, again, we had, a, we had a, a good finance committee meeting yesterday, and Chris was able to explain a couple of opportunities that um, he was able to implement um, in almost real time uh, which again probably goes back to what you talked about, James. That it probably saved us from having a further loss of you know one or two percent. Great, great. Thank you, Bill. Another question here: How did Northwest Health Foundation ultimately make the decision to go OCIO? Did you have a non-discretionary traditional relationship before going OCIO? Uh, so. 
you know, again, prior to this, uh, we had a full-time CFO. Uh, we had, again, the more traditional model working with our consultant. Uh, we had, uh, what, completed almost a year and a half of a switch mm -hmm. from a prior consultant. And so we had that under our belt. And um, when we were dealing with the reality of how we could be more effective going forward and we needed to make some major adjustments in how we do business, um, it, it just seemed like a very logical opportunity for us to review the OCIO opportunity as being the next logical step for our finance director and our investment committee, finance mm -hmm. committee to go forward. So uh, it was just one of those, um, I, I think, by luck, the opportunity really uh, presented itself based on uh, some strategic redirection that we made at the foundation uh, to really say, well, what else could we do um, instead of having um, all of those different things coming in and uh, to the desk of our CFO? Okay, thank you again, Bill. Uh, one other question. How do you gauge the effectiveness of the OCIO relationship in terms of benchmarks for success? I think, you know, the bottom line is um, Arnett and Messina uh, made us a very attractive um, proposal for incorporating the OCIO um, work into our relationship with Arnett and Messina. Um, again, we quite honestly, um, the, the value in comparison to the additional cost for us to Arnett and Messina uh, was negligible, and if anything, it's, it was it's a hell of a deal. So, so again, if anything, we we were very pleased. We we hope that you haven't miscalculated the, the amount of time and effort that you have to put in place to do that. But I think again, you have enough clients uh, similar to us who want to use an OCI approach uh, that, in, in essence, we can spread the cost of the time that Chris or your other or that you're doing, James, uh, across your client base and so we don't have to pick up uh, that um, time that you know normally um, we, we, uh, we would have with a, if we had a, a person on staff. Today. Sure. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I, one, I last have one additional item to throw sure, out Chris. there just from a benchmarking perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. We consistently and this even goes to our last meeting bill. We, again, we're surveying in, you know internal staff with respect to service standards you know, um, our deliverables, et cetera. There are, I mean, we're always looking for feedback to improve. And so that's one, I mean, I would say service standards is one benchmark performance is one of the others. Are we meeting all of those various key factors and metrics with respect to not only organizational needs, but also performance? Yeah. And I think, you know, as I mentioned to, to Chris and, and James in the past that, um, from some of my prior service on, on some larger foundations, um, I still get access to fun fire every day. So I kind of, you know, I, I'm not an investment professional, uh, but it's interesting just looking at some of the different articles and, and what's happening in, in your, in the financial services industry. Uh, and, and again, I was, um, you know, particularly interested in, a, I think it was a Mercer report uh, a couple of weeks ago, again, talking about how, um, again, you know, they're, they're, there will be different organizations out there that are going to look back to the first quarter, the second quarter as we go forward and really talking about and, and trying to quantify the advantage of an OCIO uh, type of relationship going forward. So, you know, I, I feel very, very good as I, also, I guess I would close by saying, you know, it's from the standpoint of the investment committee or finance committee, uh, we know that once we, agree on an allocation this is where we'd like to see you know the different asset classes that of course the reality today is that it's so much easier for an arnix and messina to go out if they have to buy an etf or you know some sort of other uh, vehicle at very low cost and then go back and really do the the work that you guys do so well of then locating hopefully the managers that will give us that additional alpha uh, on our return so uh, again i think that we're, we're fortunate to be part of a world uh, that, you know, is is really working in real time. Again, it's interesting what, what yesterday was the first day that they allowed traders back on the floor in New York. But um, again, when you see just how dynamic and complex 
uh, all of our financial uh, opportunities are, as James brought out, uh, that boy, it's you know, <laughs> it's it's not my dad's Oldsmobile anymore. I'll tell you that. <laughs> More like a Ferrari sometimes. <laughs> Uh, one last question here. Uh, uh, I, I guess this is for both Bill and Chris. How are investments in illiquid alternatives such as private equity handled through the OCIO approach? So I think what they're getting at is both the uh, implementation, i.e. the paperwork, as well as the ancillary capital calls and things of that nature. Maybe I'll start if you don't mind, Bill. Sure. Um, biggest way from our perspective is the daily capital you know, commitments in terms of contributions, distributions, even in-kind distributions of stock, we handle that. And we'll have standing instructions that give you a census to policy around that, meaning we're not gonna hold a single security past that distribution date. We're gonna liquidate it right away because we don't have an opinion on those securities. So we're going to liquidate it unless we have some other guidance from that perspective. So that's the, the cleanest way to put that operational calls and distributions uh, from a private market standpoint. We do have two different ways we do handle private markets investments. We have had power of limited, you know, power, uh, limited power of attorney, I should say, in certain instances with clients where we're signing on their behalf. Mm -hmm. well, it saves a lot of time. Yeah, it saves a lot of time and it saves a lot of paperwork on their end. Again, though, the portability of that is less so uh, to what Bill had mentioned. If you maintain it at the director of finance level and that person is either, you know, I would say more full-time than part-time, but part-time still works. If that person is the conduit for all of the additional sign, you know, signatures, et cetera, and we don't have, there isn't the necessary need to track down a committee chair, et cetera. Yeah. We can absolutely do it in that way also. Um, neither way is necessarily tremendously more beneficial than the other. It just happens to be what's the time and resource commitment from our standpoint, we like it to have the limited power of attorney. But again, we understand that that also requires, if there's ever a change in uh, OCIO, meaning away from us, they're going to have to make sure that they go through all, all of those various investments and have all those signatures updated as opposed to having it internally held, uh, which will provide additional efficiencies should they make a change. But it's just a give and a take. It's just a matter of in what fashion you want to make those administrative changes. Yeah, well, and of course, you know, at Northwest Health Foundation, you know, we have made uh, some changes. And so, needless to say, a lot of time of, you know, taking a picture of my passport, my driver's <laughs> license, you know, good old DocuSign and everything. Oh, else. utility and, bills. And I really feel it goes back to that, again, the role of compliance and knowing uh, that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're crossing those T's, we're dotting those I's. Uh, and of course, this, it is interesting. Uh, how some of these things get lax over time uh, if you don't have that type of, of compliance oversight. So again, I, I certainly didn't mind going through all of that. Uh, I think again, the other you know big change that I've seen uh, compared to you know the original role of consultants. You know, again, uh, a stockbroker who's changed their name a bit and you know uh, put out a different shingle. Um, again, is the fact that. Uh, we probably, you know, most organizations are going to need some level of non-traditional investments um, in their portfolio, particularly to guard against a, a major downside. And mm -hmm. so, uh, again, I think, you know, the reality is for us, um, uh, we have to work with a consultant and an OCIO who really is working with a team of people that are really policing and understanding, particularly the alternative investment world and how it's working, how it's changing, what is its role going forward, where are the opportunities, and, and again, that's the type of feedback that we got not only from a, from a discretionary consulting role, but I think this is gonna be amplified uh, by Chris uh, working on our behalf to make sure that we're aware of some of these opportunities of which we spoke of one yesterday uh, that was very opportunistic uh, for, um, for our organization and the fact that uh, you guys were made aware of it and be able to uh, implement it as quickly as possible in the alternative investment world, which is sometimes, again, can be a long haul to get your money out. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Well, good. Well, that is the end of our questions, and we are at time. So uh, if we didn't get to your question, we'll get back to you individually. If you have follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to Chris or myself. 
Uh, there will be a recording going out to all invitees over the next few days. We're also circulating around a survey. Uh, please take a few minutes to complete it. Uh, this will help us provide the information that you want to see. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Stay safe and feel free to review our website for other interesting blog posts, webinars, and podcasts. And please, uh, again, reach out to Chris or myself for further discussion. So that concludes today's webinar. Thank you, Bill, for your participation. And thank you all for joining us. Take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye.